traits are the Pasteur effect, Crabtree effect, and Custer's effect. In the Pasteur effect, presence of oxygen actually inhibits fermentation and favors glycolysis and Krebs cycle and electron transport. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. The microbe will make about 19 times more ATP per glucose using glycolysis, Krebs, and electron transport than it would um, performing fermentation. But this third bullet point is key. It only occurs under limiting sugar conditions. So it allows cells to make the most ATP from a small amount of sugar. The Crabtree effect occurs under high sugar con concentrations where cells actually favor fermentation to ethanol rather than utilize Krebs. So in this case, there's oxygen, but the sugar concentration is really high. And so rather than going for the uh, maximum ATP effect, the microorganisms will favor fermentation to produce ethanol. So the question that I leave you with is, why is that? And that'll be a good exam question. Why would an organism do that under high sugar concentrations favor fermentation to ethanol? The Custer's effect is actually also referred to as a negative Pasteur effect. Um, in this particular case, Brett, this is primarily Brettanomyces, ferments glucose to ethanol faster under aerobic conditions. So fermentation is actually inhibited under anaerobic conditions, which is counterintuitive. So again, Brett ferments glucose to ethanol faster under aerobic conditions. One of the reasons for that is that its glycerol 3 phosphate phosphatase activity is limited, and so that's pictured here. And so um, if you think about this in terms of balancing out um, oxidation and reduction reactions, this is a really important reaction here for, for spending reductant, for, for um, using NADH to, to generate oxidized NAD. And so if you don't produce this reaction very effectively, then all these other reactions in the red box that produce reducing power are going to overwhelm the system and you're going to have an excess of electron carriers that need to be burned. And so in this particular case, the organism Britannomyces lacks this capacity or, or is a limited capacity and therefore the reductant builds up. And so the microbe needs an approach for burning up that excess reductant. So again, increased reduction of NAD plus to uh, NADPH um, <clears throat> results in a lower uh, to result in a lower level of NAD plus is essential. Um, one of the things that the micro will do is nitrate assimilation to abolish the Custer's effect. So it basically introduces introduces a new pathway to um, spend some of this excess reducing power. And so here you see. Um, if nitrate is available, the microbe can then um, basically uh, um, oxidize the, uh, I'm sorry, reduce the nitrate and generate um, or, and burn off some of that excess reductant. And obviously this pathway will be favored too. And so again, the organism is going to um, ferment, is going to prefer to ferment glucose to ethanol in order to enhance the ability to burn up this excess reductant. And if the microbe has some nitrate around, it can even more efficiently burn up the excess reductant. And so now these oxidized NADs can be used for these various reactions and you get a bit of a balance. So here's, here's a look at that graphically. This is the aerobic anaerobic shift in Britannomyces. Um, and so again, we're looking at concentration of substrate here and then oxygen concentration here. So this first section is aerobic. And again, glucose is, is rapidly fermented under aerobic conditions. But if the, if the oxygen gets used up, the microbe will actually enter a lag phase, as you see here, as it transitions into the anaerobic world where there's no oxygen. And as I showed you in the previous slide, the lack of NAD plus actually slows this process, slows down glycolysis and induces this lag. One of the other things that we notice is that acid formation remains very consistent and, and um, it's, it initially is built up, but then there's no more acid produced. However, not surprisingly, the microbe will produce um, a fair amount of ethanol in this process. And so again, looking at it this way, 
this pathway here is is turned off these these you know excess reductant producing pathways are turned off so that the organism can actually favor these pathways that burn up the reductant another interesting reaction in wine microbiology are the aroma and flavoring reactions of lactic acid bacteria like Enococcus eni and this organism will um, undergo a citric acid or diacetyl metabolic reaction um, to produce a very important flavoring compound called diacetyl and so we often see diacetyl in white wines like these sort of butter bomb chardonnays um, that were that had been popular for a long time I don't know what the status of their popularity is these days but um, anyway, it starts with uh, six carbon citric acid, and the six, six carbon citric acid is cleaved into a you know, two carbon acetic acid and four carbon oxaloacetate by citrate lyase, and then the um, oxaloacetate can be used to make amino acid, the amino acid aspartate, for example, it could also be decarboxylated into a three carbon pyruvate, and so now the pyruvic acid can be. Um, um, in this particular case can be reduced to lactic acid and by and you can look at the enzyme um, just like I showed you previously lactate dehydrogenase the pyruvic acid can be converted to acetylphosphate and then um, in the presence of acetate kinase can be used to um, make acetic acid and ATP so you've seen this before in the heterolactic fermentation pathway Pyruvate can be decarboxylated as well by pyruvate decarboxylase to make acetyl TTP. In this particular case, you need a little TTP to make this reaction go. Or the um, uh, and in combination, the pyruvic acid can be used to make alpha acetyl acetylactic acid. And so again, this this guy can be decarboxylated to our desired end product called diacetyl. So this gives the the buttery, um, creamy sort of um, characteristic. The um, a further reaction that you see here by diacetyl reductase happening here, or the acetyl uh, acetylactic acid being converted by this decarboxylase to acetoin, sort of a step beyond um, acetoin and 2,3-butane diol. These are the reactions that I showed you in the previous slide of um, butane diol fermentation. And so in this particular case, a microbe, ideally you'd want the microbe to sort of stop here or you'd want the fermentation to stop here so you can get as much of this more robust buttery flavor. Um, acetone and butane diol have a similar aroma, but the sensory threshold is much higher. I think it's, you know, something like, um, something like 20, 30 times. You need 20, 30 times more of it to get the same effect as you would with diacetyl. This is a schematic diagram of the main pathways of nitrogen metabolism in yeast. The main things that I want you to get from this is, number one, the green are the essential amino acids that the um, yeasts need. The reds are the non-essentials. And here's an image of the um, TCA or Krebs cycle. And specifically, at the level of alpha-ketoglutarate, you have these glutamate dehydrogenases and glutarate dehydrogenases that, that um, um, will grab amino groups off of both essential and non-essential amino acids and transfer these amino groups to alpha-ketoglutarate to make glutamate. And then glutamate can be further um, aminated to make glutamine. So these essential amino acids that can be used to make um, lots of other different kinds of amino acids. And then interestingly, these um, non-essentials that have been deaminated can then be used to make fusel alcohols and fusel acids, which I'll talk about in a bit. This is another aspect of nitrogen metabolism that I think is pretty interesting, the metabolic reprogramming in the transition from nitrogen-starved to nitrogen-rich yeast cultures occurring at two main levels. First thing that microbes can do when they transition from nitrogen-starved to nitrogen-rich um, is alter the activity of amino acid permeases. So if, if the conditions are super rich, they can um, turn, if enriched for certain amino acids, they can turn on permeases, which are little pores or channels that can bring in certain amino acids. Um, <clears throat> the, and another thing that they do is, is modify gene expression in a way um, to repress 
the um, nitrogen catabol catabolic um, repression type genes. And so these, um, this NCR sensitive expression is modulated by the synchronized action of four um, transcription factors. And so I'll give you a, an example of that. Um, but first I would say that you know, non-preferred nitrogen sources like these guys here would be um, de-emphasized if more readily usable, preferable nitrogen sources like these guys are present. So genes for the utilization of these compounds would be shut off or de-emphasized in favor of genes for the utilization of these compounds um, if, if you're in a nitrogen-rich environment. So that's typical of microbes. They'll often do that. Well, they'll, they'll pick a preferred substrate um, something that they get more energy from or something that's easier to utilize and they'll they'll activate gene expression to gobble that up first and then they um, once they've gobbled up the preferred source then they can turn on genes for the utilization of other things that are less preferable and so one of the mechanisms for that is pictured here here we're in a, a, a an environment rich with a preferred substrate like glutamine and that activates a GATA factor called GZF3 and GZF3 can actually shut down genes for um, GAT1 directly. So that's what you see here. This thing is showing you that this transcription factor sits on this gene here and turns off GAT1. And the other thing that GZF3 can do, this is the protein, GZF3 protein can actually stop GAT1 protein from, from it doing its job. The job of GAT1 protein is to turn on these NCR genes. And so again, um, these NCR genes would be genes that are necessary for the utilization of less preferred amino acids. Remember that glutamine is present, so we don't want to use these less preferred amino acids. And so again, GZF3's job is to shut all this down so that we can so that the cell can utilize its preferred substrate. An interesting aspect of metabolism is the Ehrlich pathway. So in Ehrlich, you're basically looking at the catabolism of aromatic amino acids like phenylalanine and tyrosine and tryptophan, or branch chain amino acids like leucine or valine or isoleucine or, or sulfur-containing amino acids like methionine. And so this, this three-step process of transamination, decarboxylation, and reduction results in the formation of um, fusel alcohols and fusel acids. So here you see that pathway that I'd been referring, I referred to before. Here's alpha ketoglutarate and a transamination reaction in which this amino group gets stuck onto alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate. And so you saw that back here. That's basically this, alpha ketoglutarate and then, and then some of these amino acid pools being used to, to put amino, amino groups on alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate. And that's an essential, and this, 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 amino acid, uh, this amino acid here is an essential entryway into the um, construction of other amino acids. But the take home message from this particular pathway is that the um, conversion of various amino acids through this three step process of transamination decarboxylation, see the, the CO2 being pulled off, and reduction, and you see the um, um, reducing power, the electron carrier dumping electrons in here and, and reducing the um, intermediate to uh, a fusel uh, alcohol in this particular case, gives us this, these characteristics that we might desire, like a floral aroma, for example, in a wine. The, for the yeast, these compounds are kind of toxic actually so the yeasts have to get rid of them but they can use them we've discovered that they the yeast can use these things and as a communication tool where they can talk to each other essentially through a process called quorum sensing where they can um, speak to each other through these chemicals and activate or deactivate gene expression depending on the circumstance and another type uh, like i said another type of uh, um, fusel uh, material is fusel acids like, like uh, phenyl acetate, which has a honey like um, consistent aroma. And so here's a ester formation, which is again, it's a, essentially a detoxification process. But, it, but for our purposes, for wine producers, it contributes um, to aroma. 
And so again, you can see a sugar enter the system and, and is, is essentially fermented to uh, ethanol. Ethanol can be converted with or can be combined with the fatty acids that are generated by acetyl-CoA through um, pyruvate decarboxylation. And so these two compounds come together and can make these um, ethyl, ethyl esters of fatty acids that have you know, these somewhat desirable candle wax soap aromas. And then over here, you're looking at how the Ehrlich pathway plays into this as well as I just showed you. So we you can produce um, higher alcohols the so-called fusel alcohols that can combine with um, acetyl-CoA and make acetate esters. And so here's a, a variety of acetate esters that maybe you're familiar with, isobutyl acetate that has a fruity aroma, or isoamyl acetate, which is a banana-y flavor, or phenylethyl acetate, which is a flowery. So, um, you know, in this particular case, the starting material typically is valine. And then in this particular case, the starting material would be leucine amino acid. And so in this particular case, the starting material is a phenyl phenylalanine. Another important uh, metabolic reaction in wine production is malolactic conversion. And so the primary reaction that Enococcus eni is, is performing that we um, use it for in the process is the conversion of, of a very tart malic acid to a softer lactic acid. So we're going from you know green apple to butter essentially. And so the microbes and, and this is the you know the, the wine relevant process here. This this one is um, not relevant to wine, but it's the same concept. But anyway, these microbes, you know, cocci have um, MLEP, a permease in their cytoplasmic membrane that can bring in uh, malic acid. And then the malic acid can be converted to lactate, and then the lactate can be pumped out of the cell using malolactic enzyme A. And so again, it's a decarboxylation step, essentially. <clears throat> this slide kind of gives you a sense for why a microorganism would do this, because it doesn't seem like it's a um, it doesn't seem like it's a very useful thing to bring in malic acid and decarboxylate it and spit it back out into the world. But um, the, the title of this uh, represents the reason. Enococcus can generate fuel in an environment such as wine through decarboxylation. And so here comes the, here's the malic acid here. It comes in through MLEP. And then um, the malolactic lactic enzyme will decarboxylate it and, and produce this lactic acid. In the process of doing this, the, the, the microorganism can um, pump the lactic acid out of the cell with a proton and 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 the control that and the controlled reentry of that proton into the cell can be coupled to ATP synthesis. So in conclusion, you know, the main thing is the malolactic conversion results in a deacidification. So you take the harder malic acid and, and exchange it for lactic acid. So that's a deacidification process. It also increases microbial stability. Um, because the enococcus strains, obviously they reduce nutrients and therefore limit the amount of food that spoilage microbes can, can grow on, if there are any. Um, we also know that enococcus strains can produce bacteriosins, which can actually kill a lot of spoilage microbes as well. So that's a beneficial side effect. And the other thing is obviously the flavor change, going from a tart green apple to a buttery, milky, softer lactic acid flavor. There's two methods of food fermentation, um, <clears throat> solid state type and submerged type. And so I don't know if you've ever done either of these, but um, um, they're, they're uh, um, actually quite fun to do on a home scale. But anyway, microorganisms grow on a, a solid, moist, uh, a moist solid with little or no free water, then that's solid state. So an example would be a sausage fermentation where you have ground up meat and then the microbes can be um, inoculated on the surface or, or crushed up soybeans to make um, tempeh. And here's some um, tempeh being made. Um, and, and we often used to do it with a traditional, in a traditional style where we wrap the soy paste in um, banana leaves and create an anaerobic environment for fermentation to take place. But you can also do, obviously, I'm sure you've all done this, <laughs> I hope, a submerged fermentation in, a, in, in which the uh, um, in which you use dissolved substrates or solid substrates suspended in a large amount of liquid. Um, and so wine and yogurt are good examples of that. And this is 
<laughs> I don't know why I have the English spelling of yogurt there, but anyway. But um, so in this particular case, you can see the difference between these two approaches. These are just a little bit about conditions. Obviously, we have to um, adjust aeration and, and, and temperature if we wanted to uh, perform a psychrophilic fermentation, a colder fermentation, like if we're brewing a lager type beer um, and using lager type yeasts or white wine where, where we want to preserve aromas and so forth at a, at a lower temperature versus a mesophilic or middle temperature. Usually I'll do that, use that for, for a lot of different kinds of cheese or, or red wine. And then a, a thermophilic type fermentation where if we're making yogurt or, um, you know, a hard dry cheese like Parmesan. And then, of course, any chemical modifications, sugar content, pH, antimicrobials, etc. Um, have to also be considered. This is just the fermentation control. You know, I, you know I'm not going to go over that or this. I mean, you've hopefully have seen these things before. And if it's useful for you to see a fermentation diagram or a control diagram, then um, feel free to look at them. I'm not going to ask any exam questions about those. And then just a brief um, mention of starter cultures. Microbes with known fermentation characteristics added to raw material and or we can use indigenous microbes um, to yield a consistent fermented end product. So the composition of, of starter cultures could be isolated and identified microbes, which is what most winemakers do. They, you know, purchase or use a very specific strain that's highly characterized, um, and then they keep it in a deep freeze or use or, or store it as a freeze-dried concentrate. Um, so an active dry yeast, for example. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes we do wild fermentations where you have a consortium that's present on raw materials. So, you know, if I'm making kimchi, for example, or sauerkraut, I just use whatever's on the vegetables, cut it up. I don't do any um, directed inoculations. You can use whatever's on the equipment or materials, and then you can add it back to the, to the um, um, add it into the new batch, you know, so, so that's, you know, typically it's referred to as back slopping, but um, so anyway, the, the little pathway looks like this. You, have a, you can have a deep frozen concentrate, then you um, pull some out and make a bulk starter, which is preferable in the wine industry. You don't want to just take deep frozen microbes and throw them into a fermentation vessel because that can obviously shock them. So we resuscitate them a little bit with warm water and so forth. And then once they've, once they have, um, once they're a little um, uh, awakened and resuscitated, they can then be um, slowly added to the fermentation vat, and then that usually produces a better, more consistent product.